that's not fair because Matthew's comment would deserve to be recorded. But, uh, <laughs> uh, listen, there's that. Sorry. Obviously, that obviously creates uh, some some uh, complications, and I know there's some brethren even in our meeting that definitely fall into this category, right? And so they they'll often go into debt, and then they'll pay the debt back in one big bed in the swoop, and then they'll. Um, they will, uh, you know, that cycle kind of repeats itself a little bit, and it's difficult. So the the issue then is it requires more discipline than if you get a regular paycheck. So what that means is that when you get that extra bit of money, you kind of have to plan, you know, how long will how long if you know in a you know you know in a in a, in a dry spell would this money have to last? What are our, what are our weekly regular expenses, non-deferrable, non-negotiable, non-deferrable expenses? And can in if, if let's say I get you know I can I can exp I hope to get paid every eight weeks, but I might not get paid every twelve weeks. You might have to think, okay, you know what? I have to I have to think about this money now lasting the next twelve weeks. Now, if I only needed it for for eight weeks, then great. I should save that bit. That now goes into an emergency. So now I got paid again, you know, and it's, so you have to build up a buffer if you're in that situation as best as you can. It's very, very hard, but you have this stable income, you will inevitably go through a dry spell and you have no buffer and it's very hard. So, so again, I think it's about knowing what your non-negotiable expenses are. I think it's, it's delayed gratification while you build up a bit of a buffer it's get, about getting a couple quick paychecks. Maybe there's a surprise one that was extra that you weren't expecting against your variable income. Great. Now you can definitely put that. You didn't. You, that was extra money. That can definitely go aside and be there for the next dry spell. So we, we do something similar from our side of things. Um, but uh, where you alluded to two bank accounts, we, we actually say to people, set up three. Your wages goes into the primary bank account, which is, as you said before, the non-deferrable expenses, you know, rent rates, phone, water, power, all those things. But then each week, um, and this works especially really good for people who are on monthly paychecks, each week you have your daily living costs sent to your daily account, and that is uh, your food, your petrol, um, and your and your other day-to-day -day expenses, you know, um, and in, in that, you only allow yourself each week what you believe that you need to live on. And that third account is your uh, your savings account. And, you know, if you've got stuff left over at the end of end of the week in your regular account, then you can transfer that over to your to your savings account. And then you do get build up that buffer. But you only allow yourself. I mean, we, we're humans by nature. We use what's in our bank account. So if you and like you said with uh, preparing yourself for buying a car if you only allow yourself what you need then it actually is behavior uh, building as well well any other questions anyone else want to pop the camera so we can see them i had um a comment to make just about um potential savings that have been really helpful for us um and we got some advice from a, a book that my sister gave me written by the barefoot investor so jimmy and abby you'll know that one maybe because they're Aussies. <laughs> um but uh there's a a website just uh, matt touched on the power of the utilities issue and um there's a a power checking website which is quite useful and it tells you what um, the most competitive rates are for internet and power and um, uh, whatever else gas and and so forth and um, it, it will tell you what the best deal is to get now and um, so I I went on that website I, I um, threatened to leave the power company that I was with and they came back with a counter offer and so we haven't paid a power bill this year yet and we haven't paid it 
since uh, October <laughs> last year. So they gave us a $700 rebate on our power. Wow. And um, I haven't got around to doing anything with our insurance, but, you know, the Barefoot Investor gives you all these uh, cues that you can say to the um, person on the other end of the line uh, when you're threatening to leave. And, um, you know, it's quite helpful to try and get a better deal out of the insur your insurance and um, just those uh, overheads that are constantly niggling away at anything you're trying to save. Uh, so, yeah, I thought that was that might be helpful for people. Yeah, That's great. Thanks for that, Dad. What was the name of the website you referred to? I think it's Power Switch, but it's um, I can send you the email of the the web address if you want. You could send it around. Um, if you uh, could, if you could, could you post that on the chat, and then we can all see yeah, it. Sure. Yep. That'll be great. It's changing all the time as different power companies bring out different deals and whatever. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. You can have a look. Hey, there's just been a question uh, to the organisers. You can reply to everyone for anyone that wants to uh, comment. But the question is, any suggestions on helpful tools slash software? Well, in terms of, of software, you know, there are several if you just go into Excel into the templates, there's several really good budgeting templates already built into Excel, you know? So that's what I always use, because I use Excel all the time for work, so I'm very comfortable with that. Um, so Microsoft has some, like I said, some built-in ones. Um, Sorted's web, website is really good. It's sorted.co.nz is full of wonderful information. Um, I strongly recommend spending some time on that website to get informed um, so they got some really wonderful calculators as well on that website to help you um, mortgage calculators and those types of calculators so I I recommend you go there um, interest.co.nz is a wonderful place to go just to kind of check up on rates that are available um, but I I found that um, all rates that banks charge are negotiable every single one of them if you if you have a term deposit the rate's negotiable. If you have a mortgage, the rate's negotiable. You know, just don't believe it's not negotiable because it, it always is. Um, but you have to, in order to be negotiable, you have to be willing to move, right? So don't, you can't fake it, right? So if you're willing, but you're willing to move, then, then those things are negotiable. Um, when I, was just, I really loved a service called Mint. Um, and mint.com, but I just don't think it's available in New Zealand, but it would allow me to take all my accounts and all my spending, would all download into one software and just, it would be able to run what I had across all my accounts and the savings and the spending. Um, there's just nothing the equivalent like that in New Zealand that I'm aware of, but maybe someone has some, some good suggestions. On top of your, um, your comment about being willing to move, um, one thing I've found um, after dealing with people who have got into financial difficulty for quite a number of years is that um, is one of the first things they say to me because one of the comments that we pass is you have to change your bank and they say to me well I've been with my bank for 30 years you know I've got three loans with them and I've got credit cards etc and they say well my bank my bank will help me and I'll be honest with everyone who's listening in or, or watching your bank actually, when you're in default, doesn't care. You're just a number on a balance sheet. Um, if you imply logic or ethics to them, then you're going further than they will. And, you know, like you said, Ben, it, you know, you can move and banking is portable. You change, change your account, change your provider, um, look for a better rate. And, you know, there are other organisations that will have you. Um, but yeah, don't and don't ever expect a financial institution to uh, to be your best mate because they aren't. They're there to make money, full stop. Yeah, there's a, a brother um, that uh, was.
was speaking in Christchurch, and he was a consultant to the banking industry. And uh, he said to me, Ben, what percentage of a bank's profits do you think it earns from its uh, top 20% poorest customers? I said, I have no idea. He said, 80% of the bank's profits are earned from its poorest customers. Because those are the people that get into debt. And when you get into debt, that's in the banker's interest. Okay? So um, you don't make money on the people that pay back their loans and pay, pay off their cards. And, you know, that's not where they make their money. So, so just be aware to back up what Matthew's saying. They're not, they're not your friend in these things, you know. Um, sometimes you can switch to another institution, you can consolidate debt, you can consolidate into a, a much easier to pay uh, payment, you can add it to a you can add it to a mortgage, you can make it there's a lot of options available um, if you're willing to to make a change. And if you're willing to make a change, often your bank will give you a better deal anyway. There's two more questions that come in, anonymous questions. Um, how essential is budgeting? I mean, can't we just trust God and get by without doing it? Uh, yeah, give that a go. If that works for you, then then continue with it. If it turns out that that ends up you spending more money than God's given you, right? Uh, then try budgeting. Budgeting is just it, it's just it's just applied humility. It's saying, I have this much, I'm going to spend this much. I'm not going to spend more than God's given me. Um, but if you find that you have an intuitive intu an intuition around not, not spending more than you have, um, then, then by all means. You know? um, but even Jesus says, if a man goes to war, he says, can he with his 20,000 go against the man with 40,000? Right? Is that mm -hmm. not planned? Right? Is that not anticipating the future and saying, can, is this achievable or not? So if the people and if generals in the world can do it, certainly a brother in Christ can do it too. Okay, good answer. Um, now there's another question, another anonymous one. I presume anonymous because they haven't they've sent it just to me. When you were in financial strife, would you be willing or did you ask for help from your ecclesia? If not, why not? Good question. Yeah. And it says, please remain anonymous. So there you go. Um, we, uh, when we were in financial strife, um, we did reach out to um, Alyssa's parents. We lived with them for a little while um, when we first moved to New Zealand. Um, and they also helped by providing quite a few meals for us. Um, and they really helped us get on our feet. Um, financially. Uh, we probably did not communicate with them well enough in that time period. That was stressful for them too. Our stress would be their stress. Um, so I would have done that differently. Um, I didn't go to the Ecclesia at the time um, because I felt like I was able to get through. Um, but if I, uh, but I certainly think that someone should, should avail themselves to the brethren if they have that need. I wouldn't want to dissuade someone of that even though I didn't go to I didn't go to the in a specific instance. Um, can I just add a thought to that? Um, we were talking about this last night, Robert and Sharon. Um, it's been a real blessing in my life um, to have had a friend who's humble enough to let us help them in a time of need and for us to have a friendship where I feel like I can honestly walk up to them and say, how are you doing this week? And to know that they'll give an honest answer and um, that at a point where we're no longer financially stressed like we used to be, that we are able to be generous with others in the way others have been generous with us. And I'm sharing that because, you know, it's, it's been a humbling experience for me to see the humility of that friend of mine who has allowed us to do that for them. Yep. There are people who want to help, but they can't help if they don't know you need help. 
yeah like like i said before you know you've got to be able to um you got to be able to um uh, have have enough humility to accept when somebody comes to you that they're doing it in confidence and you know they're probably carrying the yoke of shame that's been applied to them by so many different uh different people from different organizations and you know they're, they're trodden down so um the first thing that anyone does when they come to us or come to me or lydia you know we reassure them that we're here to listen to them and that's the first step in reconciling what the issue is you know at the end of the day for a lot of people um you know i use i use the phrase it's only money you know and when you've got um twenty thousand dollars of debt you can't pay and you've got two hundred thousand dollars of debt you can't pay it doesn't make a difference it doesn't make a blind bit of difference between having five thousand dollars of debt you can't service and five hundred thousand dollars you know it's it's just it's just a number on a sheet and when when people actually can realize that situation and and take it for what it is um you know they put that to side and and focus on what they need to do in their own life and then everything else starts to fall into order like you guys have done you know you've you've looked at your situation you you asked for help at the right time and you received the help obviously not just from uh, parents but but from god he's given you the guidance and the direction that you can have to to be able to push forward now again when somebody comes to you to ask for help you know they've made a massive step out of their own bubble and out of their own comfort zone um, dealing with with such a what can be a horrific thing you know money problems tear marriages tear families apart so they've come to you you know if anyone comes to me it's in complete confidence and you know um, congratulate them for for making that step forward as you said yesterday, Ben, um, there are three things people don't like discussing, religion, sex, and money, and people prefer to talk about sex than money. That's how hard it is for people to talk about their financial problems with each other. Um, another question that came through, what about people who have loans um, that is, other loans, not a mortgage, just loans, but are struggling to pay their rent. Do you mind if I take that one? Go for it, man. Yeah, for sure. The basics of life come before anything else. That's food, shelter, clothing. Now, the way we do a budget with somebody is completely different to how somebody would do one if they were going to a um, uh, perhaps a budgeting organisation because we put the the necessities at the top and we put the loans at the bottom because at the end of the day if the worst comes to the worst you can always look at some form of insolvency you can't starve your children full stop you know there's ethics involved. I understand that. But again, you're dealing with organisations that aren't ethical. You can always talk to a financial um, a lender and you can ask for terms of hardship. You can uh, restructure. There's any number of things that you can do from the lending side of things. But you can't starve your children. You can't starve your family. Thank you. Here's another one. What are your thoughts on the verse, oh, no, man, anything? regarding mortgages yeah it is a good question um I, and i don't know that i have a complete satisfactory answer and i'd be willing to take someone else someone else's guidance on this um uh the fact is when you when you owe money you are encumbered and burdened with that um so the idea then of of paying off your mortgage early and doing that as, as you know as readily as possible is is um, you know is a is a good idea, right? Because obviously you know it gives you a lot more freedom to to do things and, and to to do things in the truth. But the um, the idea there, if you owe someone something, you owe them a debt of loyalty, 
and as a result of that debt of loyalty, perhaps you are unable to represent, you know, the truth or represent the things you believe in. And certainly in the time of, of uh, the Roman times, owing someone money was a very dangerous thing because, of course, if you didn't pay it back, um, as much as Matthew talked about not paying back your loans and restructuring things, in those days you could easily be put into prison, you know, or in Jesus' parable of Matthew 18, uh, you know, the guy who wasn't able to put back his loan, his, his children were sold into slave were, were sold into slavery in that parable. So the implications then of owing money and not paying it back were, you know, the stakes were maybe a little bit higher. I'm not trying to say the Bible is can, can be completely tech contextualized. I'm saying that the implications of not paying back a loan were maybe a little bit more severe in those times than they are in our times. Um, I certainly have a mortgage. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, but I try not to, uh, go into debt for things that, that fall in value. If I can avoid it, things like cars or, or consumer products and things like this. But if someone has a more scripturally satisfying answer about how they're not going to get into a mortgage, then I'd love to hear it. Well, you've also got to bear in mind that scripturally, um, uh, usury was uh, effectively prohibited. Now we're living in times which are which are very different from that. Um, Organisations can charge up to a thousand percent interest and uh, and get away with that as being acceptable. Um, but at the same time, uh, there are provisions allowed for organisations to write funds off um, from people who don't pay them. Uh, so you know those organisations have been given relief. Um, if, if I was to say scripturally, um, you know, oh no man, anything, that's, that's a very good cause of action because again, you are, you are a slave to the, to the people who you owe. And, um, if, once you get behind, they, they will take no, um, hesitation and letting you know that you are their slave. <laughs> um, but to the same token, you know, some of the, some of the guidelines are, you, for example, if your washing machine bre breaks down and you need another one, um, if the warranty on a replacement is going to be two years, then you wouldn't take a loan on that or you wouldn't borrow against that for more than the period of the warranty. Otherwise, your washing machine breaks down and you've still got the loan that you're paying for that washing machine and then you need another one. So you've got two loans for one washing machine. Um, you know, that sort of rule of thumb is, uh, is you know, quite quite good for, um, especially people who are starting out, young people who are furnishing a house, you know, never take a, a loan more than a warranty period. Good advice, yeah. Got any other questions from anyone? Uh, I don't know whether you can hear me, Neil Todd, but... Yep. Um, uh, Anthony Eusthersen was asked exactly the same question at a Bible school many years and many years ago and he said you don't owe a man anything unless you get behind in the contract so he said if you're paying the interest um, and you're meeting that commitment you don't owe anybody anything I'd have to be to differ with you Neil because okay. um, because if you look at all the loan contracts that people sign, and it's general practice, um, if, especially in mortgages, um, you'll find that the words on demand are written into the contract. So at any point in time, the creditor can demand the full value of the outstanding debt. Yeah, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the moral issue that the scripture says, oh, no man, anything. Our problem is that when we took the word O, oh, we think of money. Uh, o oh can be a lot of different things. Okay, so if someone cuts, comes and cuts my grass, so I'll take their children down to the beach. Then I don't owe them anything. Can you get the idea? It was the moral principle that was being answered, not not about finance. Right, of, of taking something and not paying for it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that in the Old Testament times that it was um, 
uh, a, a thing that in the year of Jubilee, um, the loans would be released or forgiven, wouldn't it? So therefore, um, by implication, loans could be given. So people could go into debt. Is, is that not true? Yeah, that actually became a problem because um, what ended up happening is that uh, people would give the loans out um, happily um, before um, the, um, the Jubilee period or just shortly into it. And then coming up to the end of the Jubilee period, nobody wanted to lend anyone anything. Um, so that in itself created its own problems within the Jewish community. Uh, well, that might well be, but the point was that loans could still be given. So the owing no man nothing, uh, um, you know, anything, um, still meant that in Old Testament times, at the very least, loans could still be taken. Cool. I think there's going to be a little bit of debate on that one <laughs> from from various points of view. Any other questions? I, I've got one more. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really thank um, both um, Robert and Sharon and Ben and Alyssa. That was just really brilliant. And also, Matthew, your contributions have been fantastic. So it's been really much appreciated. I mean, like if I looked at my history, I've, I've been through a business that went um, into receivership. So I've been through some pretty difficult times. And um, I, I've always been good at like reading P&Ls and balance sheets and doing stuff for business and understanding finances. But from a personal point of view, I've probably been rubbish at my own finances. So, so what you've actually done tonight has been like very helpful. You know, even now, 52 years old, I'm still actually able to take on board and say, wow, there's a lot of stuff there. And, and when we went through hard times, we had a lot of um, brothers and sisters, some that are actually on this um, group at the moment that were very supportive and very helpful. Um, and so that's been fantastic. So first of all, thank you. But then there was one comment that was kind of a drop in comment that you made at the end, um, Ben, that I'm very interested in. And it was in regards to the fact that God, you know, puts some people in the ecclesia that are wealthy and some people are not, and that it's obvious to you that, you know, the design of that should be, and, and, and I'm guessing you're talking about the principle of the first century ecclesia in Acts chapter four, where he that had much and he that had little, that they um, had all things in common almost you might say, like a communist um, society. Um, but it worked. It was clear that they had great joy and the ecclesia grew immensely from this principle. Um, how do you see that in today's world? Do you see that really from an ecclesial point of view, this is something that we should be looking at? you know, as a possibility, particularly in where we're going in the world at the moment, that, you know, we may find a lot of our ecclesial members are out of jobs. Some of them are essential workers are going to have jobs. And to what extent does, you know, Acts chapter four suddenly come into play? Yeah, so thank you for your, for your question there. Um, and I don't know that I have all the wisdom in the world to answer that question sitting off the top. But, but let me just say that, um, I've, I've intended for some time just to do a, a thorough Bible study on money um, because I have an interest. Is it just me or? Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Wave if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Right. Maybe it's just you, Ron. I've, I've had some intention of doing um, a Bible study on money, and that's one question I, I intend to look at. But for what I can say, what I can tell, the scripture is overwhelming in its declaration that if God has given you wealth, then your, oper your responsibility with that is to be generous, is to look after those who are in need. There's, you, can't, you can't contextualize that. You can't just say that was relevant for one time period. You can't just give the idea that this is something that's a... It's a um, it is a, uh, 
you know, hey, if you if if you want to, it's optional. It seems to be uh, it seems to be a very clear and thoroughly repeated commandment. So if we're aware of brothers and sisters who are in need and they are willing to take of our help, I think we I think we have an obligation to offer it, especially in those situations where God has put someone in your ecclesia or someone in your family where you have some intimate knowledge of their issues. A lot of times we may not have specific knowledge, you know, maybe the AB do, maybe, maybe there's, or maybe they put a call out for assistance or help. Um, but the, uh, but, but the requirement to give is seems to be overwhelmingly clear and, and undeniable. So if we find ourselves over the next six months and an unemployment goes to like worst case scenarios of 20%, you know, um, I was reading a paper put out by uh, the ministry earlier this week, and there's, you know, they're projecting different potential outcomes from COVID, depending on how long lockdown lasts, et cetera. And, you know, there's scenarios where one out of five people that want a job doesn't ha don't have one. And probably that means that, that uh, there's another 20% of people that are in jobs that are just part-time, you know, not what they're looking for. In that scenario, there'll be a, quite a lot of hardship. And I think I think the Ecclesia would absolutely have to look after the needs of the flock. And those mm -hmm. people that were fully employed should should probably feel, if they can, an obligation to only spend what they need to on themselves so they have more to offer others. Um, at least that's how I would interpret that for myself. Um, and, um, you know, I would encourage others to think hard about it. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I have an anonymous one as well. Uh, how can we be wise as serpents and gentle as doves? E.g., people who need, sorry, people who keep needing money because they keep overspending. Mm. It's a good question. <laughs> so, well, the first, sorry, you, you take it, Ben. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, was I the only person that thought of my children? You know, um, <laughs> you know, anyone else? You know, um, and uh, so, and I think with your children, you, you. You you can either the old adage goes you can either give person a fish or you can teach them to fish right so what you're actually trying to do is not you know is sometimes you give them money it may not help sometimes what you actually have to do is help them right and so if you find yourself in a situation where giving people financial resources is causing more harm then um, I think the wise thing to do is if they're looking to be helped is to help them. <clears throat> but they don't want help if they just want money and that money is going to harm them. You have to trust that God will bring them to a position where they learn that that's not a, that's not a, a solution that's going to work for them, right? Meaning that they may have to, their, their pride may be invoked such that actually God has to bring back conditions in which the humility of the situation affects them to create a change of heart and a change of attitude, whereby the help that they get will actually be helpful, right? But on no wise can we ever look at someone like that and and hold back love from them, you know? Um, and also there might be situations where there's, uh, there's uh, victims, maybe someone is very unwise with money, but there's children involved, you know? So, you know, what do you do then? You know, how do you make sure you help the children? These are agonizing and difficult situations. So I think it, I don't think there's one uh, wise answer or one right answer, but you know, you probably have to look at it and think, you know, is God, what can I do if I can do something? Um, and is that thing gonna be helpful? And re recognizing that making is a matter of prayer and that God knows is also wise. Uh, but with that, you know, Matthew, what would your thought be? 
Well, I mean, I liken it to a gambler. Um, a gambler comes to you and says, I need some money. Do you give them money? Um, I think the, the scriptural passage, it has to be, um, you know, the stumbling block um, a parable. You know, do you, do you put, a, put a stumbling block in front of your brother or do you try and help him over that stumbling block so that, um, so that he can um, get to where he needs to go? And, um, you know, yes, the money, the money will help, obviously, uh, in the short term, um, but uh, sometimes sitting down, talking with somebody, going through their situation, you know, helping them see um, things that can change and things that can't, recognising the picture as a, as a whole picture, as opposed to just what's going on here and now, uh, I think that can make a huge amount of difference. Uh, Dave and Pip have just put up a, a quote. Um, Whoso hath this world's goods and sees his brother have a need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? From 1 John 3, verse 17. Yeah, I think the key thing too also is understanding, as Ben said, rightly said, the need. Um, because often sometimes the need is the symptom, not the problem. Yeah. You've got to bear in mind also that God didn't create money. God created us to help each other. Um, God created Eve for Adam as a helpmate. You know, he didn't create Eve with a bank account. You know, at the end of the day, um, money is not uh, what we need to have to approach our God. Um, what we need is um, to be able to, um, to, to show those things that, that Jesus wanted us to do. You know, he th overthrew the tables of the money changers because the people in the temple had lost sight of faith. The, they, they didn't know what grace was. So he had to remind them that it's not about what sits on the table. It's about what's inside the heart. Mm. There's another comment on the uh, chat that says, uh, the need is sometimes education, which I think is a very good summary there. You know, it's, it's not always the money that we give, but it's the, it's the help, it's the education, helping them get over that hurdle uh, rather than rather than just you know buying their way out of it. I think the other so the other thing to add to um, I think the question that um, Ron you request you know you talked about with respect to ecclesial giving and contributions to to help one another. I think the other thing too is to remember that. Not everything, no, not everyone can give monetarily, but everyone can give from a service perspective and a caring perspective. And, um, and I think that the key here is to understand that giving isn't always monetary. Um, it's understanding each other's needs and being able to give as we are able to give. Um, and that's the principle of, it, of the parable of the talents, isn't it? And if, if we can do that, and if we are able to give and understand each other's needs, then the likelihood of being able to help each other is so much greater. And I think that would be a key principle moving forward over the course, obviously, the next 12 months, is that getting to know each other and giving as we are able is going to be fundamental. I, I think um, just on that, Sam, because I think that's really good. And I just like coming back to the thought on this is that part of this is, uh, and, and you said it well, is knowing each other's needs and understanding it. And and I, I was really impressed, Ben and Alyssa, with your um, you know family get-togethers you have on a Sunday night to be able to discuss things. And I. Just wonder, you know, from an ecclesial point of view, that maybe, you know, particularly in these times where we start ecclesial get togethers where there's a pretty open forum to be able to discuss specifically financial needs and the needs people have, so that we're aware of where we may be able to help, whether it's monetary or whether it's by whatever means. Um, and I guess this, this forum allows us to be able to do that perhaps easier than we've ever had to be able to jump onto a go-to meeting and say, right, we're going to get together and just 
have a welfare discussion about people's needs um, in alert level three or in alert level four or wherever we are on the walk down, as you say, Ben, but, but maybe having that open, frank discussion. One of the hardest things that you're going to find going forward is, and um, Ben, uh, Alyssa, you know, you, you, I'd like your comment on this because the hardest point is the point where you recognise you're you're actually um, heading either heading towards you being out of your depth or you are out of your depth because the sooner you can recognise it, the sooner you can get the right help and the sooner that you can get back on the path. Um, but um, you know, Ben Alyssa, you know, how how did how hard did you find it to actually recognise that point where you knew that things were at the wrong heading down the wrong path? Um, well, what happened was I was getting very stressed about our house build and about it going over budget. So Alyssa recognised that, so she took over that. Um, it was probably the mistake. <laughs> and Alyssa said I had. And then one day Alyssa had a conversation with me where she said, uh, we've overspent by $40,000, but I'm not sure how. And that was the moment I realized I was out of my depth. And it was a, it was a very, you know, and this was not Alyssa mismanaging. It was a little bit of a difficult to manage build process because it was done on time and expense rather than a fixed budget. And by the way, if you're ever going to build, um, don't do time and expense. Only ever do a fixed budget. Um, and uh, nevertheless, that happened. So what that really required of us, right, was um, uh, was to sit down and seriously consider, you know, okay, our mortgage payment is not going to be this, it's going to be this. So. So what that means is that we just had to really cut out a lot of discretionary things. You know, uh, when I first got to Christchurch, I was driving Rose's beat up, beat up old uh, 1998 Honda Civic with a with a with in badly need of a paint job. Right? You know, I I actually had my boss tell me you are never ever allowed to pick up a client. You know, <laughs> but I was able to buy that thing for two thousand dollars, and it got me from here to there, right? So, so what what you do, right, is you just go, well, this is our situation, right? Well, I don't like it, but here we are. Um, if you get to the if you get to the point where you can't even afford that, you got to go back and talk to the bank. Like if people can't, if people aren't working right now, and they're not getting income. You should 100% be talking to your bank because they'll give you a six-month uh, loan holiday right now, almost over the phone, right? So you can just not pay your loan for six months, you know. So, you know, you you've got to go. You got to just kind of swallow you know, the humble pie and say, who do I, who do I owe money to that I can't pay? And to Matthew's point, I'm going to feed my kids, right? That's not going to be the last thing I do. And I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to renegotiate those loans. Trust me, people would rather renegotiate with you than you renege. It's a lot more costly for them for you to renege on your loan than it is for you to renegotiate. They're a lot happier for you to do that. So, um, so what we didn't have to renegotiate the loan, but a couple things happened. So when we first got our loan, uh, we were paying 5.25 percent interest, right? I think now we're paying like 3.25% interest. And what I've done is I've just kept the mortgage payment the exact same amount every time. Mm -hmm. So as I've paid less interest, I've just paid more principal on the rationalization that someday interest will go the other direction, in which case I already have a shock absorber built into my uh, built in my loan payment. I can I can afford more interest payments when those eventually come and if they don't come then i'm just going to pay off my loan quicker right and that money goes and i so i've always i've had the same mortgage payment even though i could take a lower payment if i wanted it um so what happened is as, 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 as things got a little bit easier for us and as i got um, established myself in my career here things got a little bit easier for us you know and so we managed to kind of work ourselves out that way 
Um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but that's what we did in terms of how we handled it. Um, well, we uh, started out at eight o'clock. Um, we were anticipating about a half hour program with a few with a few questions at the end. And it's now an hour and a half later. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, participated.